Okay, guys, we are live. Live stream. And uh, right now, the current time is uh, 3 p.m. on Saturday the 25th. So if you're watching this and it is not that time, by the way, that's Eastern Standard Time. Uh, if you're not watching at that time, um, you're probably catching the rebroadcast because once, uh, once we're done here, uh, YouTube is going to go ahead and um, republish this. So that's kind of the rebroadcast. But for all you guys uh, coming in live, thank you so much for joining. Um, real fast, I guess a couple announcements. I tried to, um, to bump up the quality of the stream to 1080p rather than 720p, but um, I kind of backed out at the last minute on that just because it sounded like my computer was going to catch on fire. I'm actually running this off of a laptop and my, uh, my broadcasting software was not at all happy with me. And we are sitting in a greenhouse, and today it's, it looks like it's gonna get really hot, and I just didn't want my computer to melt. So hopefully uh, 720 looks good enough for now. So uh, just before we get started, um, in, in the live chat uh, on YouTube, just let me know if I sound okay. Um, so far it seems like uh, the, the audio levels are right and everything. But if not, um, just let me know. I'm going to say hello to everybody. So uh, the other thing is we're a little bit shorthanded today. So usually uh, one of my friends, Robbie, is the one that uh, hops into chat and, um, and uh, does most of the communication with you guys via text. Uh, he's not here, so um, I have a feeling that text is going to be the text chat is going to be more or less like 4chan. So you guys are on your own there. I'll, I'll try to, uh, to check in, um, but as far as like my ability to actually write back to you guys might be a little bit, uh, little bit limited. So anyways, real fast, let's quickly go over the rules. Um, I'm sure that this is uh, repetitious for, for many of you that have been here before, but I'm also guessing that um, plenty of folks haven't seen one of these live sales before. Uh, basically, open up TitleGardens.com, and in the top left, you'll see like a live sale link. Uh, click on that, and you can actually see all the different items that we're going to be uh, going over. They're just like a numbered list of items, so like item number one, two, three, four, all the way up today to 125. So it's a slightly smaller sale than the one that we had in June. Um, obviously, uh, watch it live on YouTube as well. And uh, YouTube is the only place that actually has that chat window, so if you wanted to communicate with me directly, that's the place to do it. I always get asked about shipping. It's a $39.99 flat rate or free for orders over $250. Um, yeah, and just, to, uh, just so you know, um, you have to actually check out with the coral in order to receive it. So uh, just putting it into your shopping cart, that's not good enough. So put it into your cart finish checking out and select the local uh, pickup slash live sale option so you're not charged shipping. And once you're all done, you can buy a shipping module to, to finish your order. Okay, so we'll cover that at one point again, probably right around item number 65 when we have to kind of like switch a few things around over here. So anyway, let us get started. I want to try to get a faster pace going. Um, for no other reason than I'm sure that you guys have other things to do on your Saturday and it's about to get blazing hot in here and um, I just don't want to pass out from heat stroke. So I got like my little polar pop here and so hopefully we'll be all right. Okay, so uh, first coral, devil's hand leather. This guy is a little over the size of a quarter but these they do grow uh, pretty quickly. So I mean once it starts getting acclimated into your tank I would expect it to um, to probably triple in size in a few months, and um, they grow like multiple lobed uh, like fingers. If you're if you're familiar with what a, one of these things looks like when it's when it's fully grown. Okay, next number two. This is our Kenya tree leather. It's a pretty nice, inexpensive uh, beginner coral. Um, you kind of have to watch out for these guys because not only do they grow fast, but they multiply. They uh, drop off a bunch of little babies, and um, once they start doing that, they can like take over large uh, portions of your, of your tank. Okay. Next up, number three, is a cabbage leather. 
This is uh, actually a type of sinularia. Um, sinularia are usually branching, kind of like that Kenya tree you saw just a moment ago. But uh, the cabbage leather kind of um, is more squat and, and, and has that, uh, I don't know if like plant-like look is the right thing, but yeah, it kind of looks like a vegetable. Number four is a purple suspicularia. Now, these things are something that I wish that I could grow better and faster because they're incredibly difficult to, to import from Australia. Um, usually when they get imported, about, I don't know, like 60 to 75% of them die during that trip from Australia. So there's actually like a big premium on aquacultured specimens um, that are grown here in the U.S. So we've had these colonies for like well over a couple of years now, but we're really running low on them. And so it's just one of those things that's always in really, really high demand that we wish we always had more of. But if you wanted to try one, they're not that difficult, but um, the, the, the biggest challenge is, is the importing, the, the importing part of it. Okay. So number five is our neon green nephia. It's one of the, the brightest of the, uh, the fluorescing soft corals. And those things grow very, very large. It's not, it's not uncommon to see uh, like one that's been established in an aquarium for a long time to be like basically from the substrate all the way to the tip top of the tank, practically growing out of the water. Uh, this one looks like it's about an inch and a half, a little bit more maybe. It's got a couple of branches, but it is a very, very fast growing soft coral. Okay, so the, uh, the person responding to everyone in chat is my mom, so everybody be nice. <laughs> Asking the internet to be nice. I'm sure that's gonna work out really well for me. Um, number six is a slightly smaller neon green nephthia. Okay, number seven. It's a tiny frag of our uh, green and blue sympodium. This was a soft coral that I really didn't even know existed until about, I would say, a year, year and a half ago. One of my customers requested it and, and I literally have never heard of it. Um, it's, it's somewhat difficult to come by, as, as, at least at the importing level, but we've been lucky enough to be propagating this for a very long time now. So it's a small frag, probably uh, about a quarter size piece. And it is fast growing once it gets established. Now when you do receive it, expect it to stay closed for a few days. Uh, for whatever reason, once it gets disturbed, it doesn't like to reopen for a long time. But by giving it a little bit of uh, extra current, that definitely helps the situation. Okay, number eight. Good old fashioned yellow polyps. Another really, really good beginner coral. Um, they're very hardy, very fast growing. The only uh, issue that I would work, uh, just keep an eye out for is the fact that uh, they do have a pretty potent sting. So you really do want to give it plenty of space so that when it does grow, that it doesn't uh, start to, to infringe on the territory of other corals because these things are pretty good at fighting. So definitely give it some space. But if you're looking for something that's inexpensive, that's bright canary yellow, um, this is probably a good choice for you. Uh, MD Aquatics is asking, is the Sympodium hardy? Yes, but it just doesn't acclimate quickly to the tank. Uh, it needs at least a week or so to, to get fully settled in. And once it does settle in, it, um, it, it can take off from there. It's a very fast growing coral right after that. But generally speaking, um, as far as hardiness, it's, it's middle of the road towards the easier side. Okay. Uh, number nine, the green star polyps. So we have two varieties of this. I don't know if we have two varieties on this live sale, but we call this one our balloon centered ones. They have like a bright uh, white, like a large kind of, well, like a balloon um, right in the middle. Whereas the other ones really don't. And the other ones are a little bit more feathery. Whereas uh, these tentacles seem to be um, less so. Another very fast growing coral. 
Now, we actually had some difficulty keeping these a while back. Um, and I think that one of the, the major this this coral is enough flow. And we weren't giving it enough flow at the time, so what would happen is algae would grow kind of all over it, and the polyps would stop opening. But once you hit it with a, with a ton of flow, um, they, they not only survive better from algae type situations, but uh, they just spread a lot faster too. All right, number 10. This is true blue zinnia. So if you recall that suspicularia that I showed you earlier, sometimes people call that blue zinnia, but it's really not a zinnia at all. This actually is a zinnia. It's very fast growing, and if you've ever seen my zinnia video on YouTube, um, I show like large colonies of this kind of swaying. They kind of, um, they don't pulse like the Red Sea varieties, but they, um, if the flow is off, you can kind of see the each of the individual um, polyps. They kind of like squirm just a little bit, so they are capable of motion. But generally speaking, you don't see very much of it once like the pumps are on and all that. But it does have a very nice and distinctive blue coloration. All right, number eleven. We have our pink and gold zoas. It's kind of hard to see the colors right now that I'm seeing on screen, um, but depending on, on how much of that polyp is, uh, is grown, like the younger polyps look different than the older polyps. So um, that's why they're kind of called pink, pink and gold. It's like once they get larger, they're a little bit more yellow. That speckling pattern is more pronounced yellow. But earlier in their, um, in their growth phase, they're a little bit more pink. I think we have another one later on that's like, it's almost like a two-tone, so we'll see if, it, if that one is a little bit more photogenic. Okay, number 12. Oops, overlays. Our pink panther zoanthids. This is going to launch into our like long section of, of zoas and pallies. I'm kind of curious how many people are on with us right now. Okay. Moving on, number 13 is a Paleothoa combo rock. We call it a combo rock because like, uh, there are these Jack Frost pallies, those, those bluish ones, those blue and purple guys. But towards the back, I think the very top one there that's not facing the camera is like a neon green um, Paleothoa. It's not as bright as like a nuclear green, but I mean, if you've seen what green uh, pallies look like, there's a few of those uh, on this rock as well. And, you know, we, of, we often get asked, what, what is the difference between zoas and pallies? And not to get too technical with it, you can kind of see a difference in the, in the actual, uh, like the tentacles and how, um, you know, actively they feed. Um, they're, I did have a discussion like on, on some of the more technical aspects, but it involves like DNA sequencing and stuff. So it's not really uh, too important for, for our discussion here. Okay, next one, number 14. Okay, so this is the other pink and gold, and I was hoping to see the two-tone nature of these. Not really, I, I, I can barely tell. Okay, so okay, now that we dialed up the exposure, you can kind of see it on the, I guess the bottom right polyp where you, uh, it, you can see the speckle but on the other half of it is more purple so you, you can get like the, the so the purple would be the um, the pink part the speckle side is the gold part yeah and it's just like there's just too much sun or something like that but it's not gonna it's not gonna cooperate that well with us you'll just have to use your imagination fortunately okay moving on number 15 not number 15. We will uh, have to change the camera lens real fast. So if, if you're new to this and you, and you haven't seen why the screen goes black like that, it's because um, the sl our slider only goes so far and then we have to, to reset things, kind of push the entire cart along. Okay. So these are the mango zoas. They have like a, a bright, um, 
a bright yellow center. Number 16. These are mellow yellow Zoas. Have a little bit of a typo there, but missing a W. Okay, number 17. Here's a purple death pally. So these guys are always pretty cool. They've got like that purple face and their tentacles are um, almost like a, a cobalt blue color. It really depends on the lighting that you keep these guys under. Like right now they're probably getting a little bit blasted here at the greenhouse, but um, I, I've seen them where they, um, they almost have like a bright blue rim of, of tentacles and a darker purple face. Okay, so Don Myers is asking, what kind of inverts do we keep at the greenhouse aside from the cleanup crew? We don't really have much of a cleanup crew even. I mean, there, we have, we've got snails, like, uh, and our favorite snails are trochuses, because trochus snails are one of the few that can actually rate themselves. I mean, a lot of like the other types of snails, sometimes when they flip over, they can't flip themselves back over, and so they just like, end up dying on their back. The trochuses can uh, flip back over. Um, sometimes we actually like to get uh, the Mexican turbo snails because they um, they just do like the greatest job with algae, but they are big big time bulldozers. Uh, we don't like um, hermit crabs at all. There might be literally one or two hermit crabs in this whole place. Uh, I just don't trust them around corals, I guess. But you said aside from the cleanup crew, I think that we have got like a a few sexy shrimp maybe in with in with our mini maxi anemones. We've got the uh, Pagarita hermit crabs. I just said we don't have hermit crabs, but I guess these don't count. They're the, they're the commensal hermit crabs that live in the Astriaporas. Okay, let's move on really quick. Uh, number 18. It's our pink plasma zoas. These guys are super cool. They've got like the, the bright fluorescent, uh, you know, pink center and the speckles uh, on a purple face. I'm trying to think what other inverts do we have? Like bismo worms as a part of like a, a Parides bismo worm rock. Number 19. Occasionally we get like a, a cleaner shrimp when if, if any of our tanks get ick or anything like that, but it's been, it's been years had a cleaner shrimp. Uh, number 19 here is uh, the Leonardo Zoas. Number 20 are the sentinel zoas. These are kind of cool because uh, their face is actually like has a, a, a blue modeling on top of what looks like red and purple stripes. Number 21. These are the creamsicle zoas. So there might actually be some radioactive dragon eyes on there as well, but the ones that we were looking at are those light pastel uh, zoas. Number 22, we got the ever popular Rastas. The only thing I wish about Rastas is they, if they, is they grew faster. Um, the reason why they're so highly sought after is they're one of the most difficult to actually get imported and survive. Oftentimes, if you ever do see them um, come into the country, um, the rock that they come on will look good for like a couple of days and then will suddenly crash. And we, we've had that happen a couple times. So we don't really go towards importing these guys anymore. Almost all of it is uh, aquacultured. MD Aquatics is asking, are we ever going to see the Pagaritas in upcoming live sales? Um, I think we had them on in one live sale before, but 
I think we only had it just that one time. Okay, now. Uh, John Myers is asking again, again, do you guys keep fish in the greenhouse? I see occasionally like a fox face or something. Yeah, we have fish for various jobs. Um, fox faces and tangs help um, with, you know, algae control, that sort of thing. We have Tasia control. Um, there's actually certain types of damsels that help with flatworm control. Right, number 24. These are the Fiji hypercolor zoanthids. I'm trying to think of what else, uh, what other kinds of fish we've got going on here. Occasionally we take in um, a rookie, like uh, I think we have a um, like a giant harlequin tusk that um, I took in from my friend Paul. And occasionally like, we have like a clownfish or something. I, I would never go buy a clownfish. They're not exactly my favorite fish. I think they're jerks. But um, yeah, sometimes, you know, somebody's taking down a tank and ask if we can take a clownfish, and so we do. Number 25. These are the mantis zoas. Twenty-six. Some strawberry sucker punch zoas. They're small, a little hard to see, but you can probably tell they've got that cotton candy pink color. Okay, twenty-seven. These are the spotlight zoas. So the spotlights, um, I wish that we could find one that is a little bit more directly on the face, but they actually have a very dark, uh, like a very dark evenly colored face with a very, very bright center. So it almost looks like this, uh, almost like a panda colored Zoa. All right, next one, number 28. These are toucans. These are kind of similar to Rastas in that um, they're very, very, very difficult to, to import. Um, they almost never come in really good condition. So almost all of these, you know, we, we pick up from other, other hobbyists that have grown them out. We try to grow them out as well, obviously, but people tend to, tend to buy them fast and they grow. And we always, uh, we, we do kind of have like little areas where we try to hide frags and people always find them and then we always ended up selling we've got our red people eaters for some reason um, our red people eaters lost their green mouths and i'm wondering if that's uh because we're in late summer now I i'm used to seeing red people eaters with that 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 reddish purple face bright red rim and like a bright green mouth so it's a little bit of an odd coloration for them right now actually the coloration is going to be pretty strange in general um, this is very late July and we always make some uh, improvements to the greenhouse because um, in years past we probably wouldn't be able to do this show not because of the, the, of the technical nature of the show but because our corals didn't look that good in the summer uh, so we've come, actually come a long way to, to have anything remotely uh, look halfway decent as far as this live show goes in the summer I mean all right uh, number 30 some Akan Bauer Bankies. Bauer Bankies are, uh, are different from Lord Hauensis or Echinata in that they have very, very large polyps. And, uh, and depending on their coloration, they can be pretty expensive. So um, the way that they grow is that they, uh, they add additional polyps right at the edge of the colony. So you get one head and it slowly turns into like four heads, which slowly turns into like eight heads, that sort of thing. It's not the fastest growing piece out there, but um, it's, I think it's, it's almost better to buy individual heads and let that grow in your system rather than buying a large colony. Because sometimes when you buy a large colony, you get a little bit of die off. And it is, like I said, a, a pretty pricey coral if you, if you buy it whole. Next up, 31. It's another Akan Bauer Banky. Different color pattern. We normally would call this like a sparkle. 
sparkle variety. And it really is, that, that's a very good color representation, like bright pink with, a, with like a bright teal highlight. Okay, 32, not 32. Time to move the rig. Okay. So the next uh, Aiken Bauer Banky is uh, a solid red. You kind of get a little cross section of the of the three Bauer Bankies that we've got there. Uh, most of them, they're, they're kind of like the, all kind of share that that uh, that pinkish red color. Um, there are different varieties, like some are like neon green and stuff like that. Expensive to get into, though, admittedly. Number thirty-three. We believe this is an Acan Echinata. Um, it might be an Acan Rotunda Flora. I, I've heard it um, sometimes identified as that. Um, the thing that's really cool about this, um, I wonder, uh, Matthew, could you like uh, dial up the exposure just a little bit? There we go. Good. If you look at the the, uh, the center of that uh, of that polyp, it's almost like a red and green uh, little rainbow pattern. So you kind of have this purple outer polyp and a rainbow looking inner polyp. Okay, number 34. There's a Rainbow Acan Lord. Now, this one in particular is predominantly yellow, which is always pretty cool. But you can see uh, the, the rainbow modeling kind of like extending into that yellow. It got a lot of pinks, greens, yellow. Nice piece, but looks like it's got about three polyps. The two big ones, and there's uh, one on the other side. Number 35. A green pinwheel, Lord, uh, Lord Hawensis. A can Lord. Go ahead to 37. This is the solid red Blasto Merletti. These guys I found like lower light. Um, whenever we've tried to keep them in anything that's uh, slightly high light, um, they tend to, to recede right away. They don't like it quite so much and start, end, up, end up starting to lose heads. But otherwise, it is a pretty fast uh, stony, growing, fast growing stony coral. Okay, 38 is our neon green Blastomusa Welsi. I think there might be two or three polyps on this guy, but it almost doesn't matter because once this thing gets growing, um, they grow very, very quickly. So kind of like how I described the, the Acan um, Bauer Bankies, these guys grow polyps along their base as well. So a single polyp can turn into eight polyps very, very fast once it gets established. Did we skip number 36? No, we, no, we didn't. Yeah. No, somebody was asking in chat if we uh, skipped number 36. Actually, go quickly, just go back to 36. It's uh, that guy right there. The red and green Blastomusa, Blastomusa Merletti. I can talk. Okay, so... Um, yeah, I think we're ready for 39. Yeah, it's, a, it's one more tank over, so. Gotta move for a little bit. One of the next videos upcoming is gonna be uh, kind of like a behind the scenes as to, you know, our little setup here, um, how we do um, this show. It's a little bit involved. 
I think I promised that last live sale though. <laughs> so we'll see if I actually get to it. All right. That looks crazy on my screen because it's like the, the you can see right through to the other side of the greenhouse and just see how just how yellow the sunlight is over there. <laughs> You're seeing this bright, bright yellow, it's great. Okay, so it's hard to, um, to see the size of these large elegances. Just, just to give you a fair warning, I think like the next seven or so um, corals are gonna be elegances. So people were kind of bummed out that they missed out on elegances last show because I think we only had two available. And um, this time we, we just added in a bunch. And so, hmm? Okay, try. So you can, uh, so Matthew's gonna move the camera around just a little bit and see uh, what some of these look like here. I don't know. So Don Myers is asking, how drastic of color change should we expect going from greenhouse to LEDs? Um, it really kind of depends. It depends on what, what, what coral we're talking about even. Um, you know, certain things like acans, they're gonna change no matter what kind of lighting you keep them under. Um, you know, even if uh, you grew them under the same lighting year round, they're gonna change at different times. So uh, I, I'm just showing you like number 40, but there's 41, 42, 43, all are large elegances. So which one is that one, Matthew? Uh, the one 40 is not what I'm on. I'm gonna go to 44. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead to 44. So hopefully you guys kind of got a cross section of, the, of, these, uh, of these different um, elegances. I would guess that they're about six to eight inches across each. Not their skeleton, but their actual flesh. If you're looking for like a showpiece, this is uh, a pretty good place to start if you like, el if you like elegances. All right, number uh, 45 is a small Aussie elegance. Let's go on to 40. The smaller ones definitely have a different um, pattern on the face. The other ones tend to be a little bit more pinstriped, whereas these have more marbling. Okay, next up, 47. Oh, not yet. It is going to be a platygyra, but we're going to move the slider. I'm kind of curious to see how long those elegances last. They typically go very, very quickly on these live sales. Something. But um, yeah, it's basically like a maze brain. I love this one because it has like the brightest green channels I've ever seen on one of these things. Nice, nice piece. Uh, 48. There's a purple Gorgonian. Scroll up a bit. Yeah, unfortunately that backlight's kind of killing us. But it's a, it's a purple um, Atlantic Gorgonian. Um, They're photosynthetic, found in the Caribbean. Number 49, it's a Blue Ridge Coral. Yeah, we're definitely gonna need more exposure there. So I was hoping that this guy would be open, um, 
but unfortunately, it's like a, they, they develop a waxy film at different times of the year, and that's used to, um, to help them shake off algae growth. So like, actually all of, the, all of these guys um, had that waxy film, and so I, I gave it a quick shake, but um, it takes still a few days for the polyps themselves to extend. So this is a, kind of in, the, in their closed state, and in their closed state, you can actually st still see like the, the, the very top edge is that blue. So that's why they call it a blue ridge coral. But at different times, this thing can be looking entirely fuzzy when the polyps come out and extend. But they don't extend that long. It's for maybe like a couple of weeks before it turns waxy again. So they go through this phase of trying to constantly clean themselves of algae. All right, number 50. Australian green torch. We get asked fairly often about torches and generally speaking we, we um, have many more frog spawn and hammers than we do torches. For whatever reason like torches grow um, more slowly for us than either hammers or frog spawn so we tend to, um, tend to have fewer of them and sometimes they don't import well so um, we're not able to like bring them in quite so often. So uh, this one and the next one, uh, number 51, are two different types of uh, Australian torches. The first one is green. This one's more of a purple and cobalt color. The tips are uh, more of a cobalt blue. So for all you folks that were asking about torches, there's your opportunity to grab a couple. And I don't think that we have any others in this whole place. It's just these two for the live sale. Uh, number 52, it's our orange and blue rhodactis. Next section here is going to be all about mushrooms. Um, uh, it's going to be a combination of rhodactis, discosoma, and recordia. Um, and we don't have any yumas, so they're all pretty similar in terms of like hair and, and hardiness. They're really, really easy to keep. They can be kept on the, on the substrate. And um, I think all of them can be fed. Most people don't go out of their way to feed mushrooms, but they can be fed. And all can be propagated pretty easily if you uh, are inclined to try. So Bethany Keeler asks, can torches be put next to frog spawn or elegance or bubble coral? Um, maybe a little bit, but I wouldn't recommend it because um, even uh, uh, two different torches or two different frog spawn they, they won't kill each other, but they will fight. You can definitely tell that there's uh, some contact going on. Uh, Chris's Reef asks, will you have any scolies? Uh, yeah, I think there's a couple later on in the live sale. Okay. Uh, next up, 53 is our green rhodactus. Somebody I think on Facebook was asking uh, for a heads up if we have any more um, like bright green rhodactus. So here's, here's one. I don't know if he's watching or not. Next, 54. It's a blue spot discosoma. Is there anything we can do about that uh, little bit of reflection? Uh, it's inside. It's inside. Hmm. Okay, it's a uh, it's basically a a red polyp with uh, with blue spots, and there's two of them on that particular rock. Okay, next up, fifty five. It's our orange rhodactus again, slightly smaller. Fifty six what we call an armored rhodactus. I think we can turn down the exposure just a little bit. Uh, we can see a little bit more detail that way, I think. A little bit. The thing that's interesting about rhodactus is you get like a lot of different morphology. I'm just like looking at the, um, uh, the orange and purple, the orange and blue versus this. I mean, the, the, the little uh, tentacles and everything look completely different. 57. It's a pale blue discosoma. 
This guy might change uh, change color a little bit. This is uh, definitely summertime color that you're seeing, where things look a little bit lighter than than they do in the in the winter. Fifty eight. It's a red discosoma. Actually, um, whoever picks this up is going to get kind of lucky because I can see it on my screen. I don't know if you can see it on the YouTube stream, but there is a small little green spot on there. And that's like a, a, a little rare color hiccup that sometimes appears on these things. And usually those mushrooms go for a lot more than $20. And so I only notice that now on stream. So good luck to whoever picks up number 58. Okay, 59. Another orange rodactus. Similar to the other two. This one's a little larger than the previous one. Okay, number 60 is a red marbled mushroom. This is one of my top two favorites as far as uh, discosoma go. It's got a lot going on on its face. Sixty-one. It's a green marbled mushroom. So, like the red, um, this one's more of like a of a teal and turquoise mottled face, with obviously like a, a, a green base. Okay, number sixty-two. You can already see it, but it's the blue spotted mushroom. And there's two of these at least. There might even be three on this rock. Yeah, there's three. Rico's Reef says hello. Sup? Okay, 63. Orange Recordia, Florida. So I heard a rumor. Like, I'm not really tied into uh, Florida collection. But I heard that um, Recordia are almost impossible to find nowadays. And a lot of folks are having a lot of difficulty getting them at all. Um, so far, we haven't experienced that, the brunt of that, because we've been propagating a lot. But um, yeah, supposedly, there might be a, an issue with not being able to get more Recordia Florida. So um, yeah, you might have to gobble them up while you can. And we're, we're definitely going to be trying to propagate as much as we can, too. Number 64. A green Recordia Florida. And number 65 is our blue Florida Recordia. Okay, looks like we're done with that set here. This is going to take just a moment because we actually have to move the entire rig. And uh, I've got to use the bathroom, so I will be right back.
Okay. So this is number 66, and it's $65, dollars the Bismarck Worm Rock. Looks like we're battling with a little bit of glare, so try your best, Matthew. <laughs> yeah. All right, moving on. This is a cool coral. Like, you know, it turns out we've had this for a long time. I just kind of didn't remember it, but it's a, it's like a neon green leptosiris. Leptosiris are becoming one of my favorite corals. They're called like wrinkle corals, although nobody really calls them that. Everybody calls them leptosiris. The next one here, number 68. Is our golden leptosiris. Somebody was asking, um, uh, yeah, Bethany was asking, Dan, do you have another Cynarina? I think there's actually a couple on this live sale. At least two. Hmm? 69. So Zach Lance asks, uh, how much of the abysmal ro rocks do you normally have? Uh, right now, I think we have like three. So I think one is on the website, like a very large one is what you see is what, is what you get. And then we have maybe just two, maybe just two right now. We try to have like, you know, a handful here and there. Hmm. Yeah, a ha handful. Uh, let's see, number 69 is uh, 70. Have to dial up the exposure just a little bit, it's hard to see. So the neon green, uh, actually both the Hydnophoras, are um, a very hardy SPS, but you do have to watch out because um, they have a very potent sting. So they're really good at fighting off um, other uh, SPS that grow right next to it. So you kind of have to be careful of that. Don Myers is asking, where does Leptosiris come from? I think it's Australian. Not really, not 100% sure on that, but I think it might be Australian. 71. It's our pink Pocillopora damicornis. Pocillopora, um, we've, so we did a, a video fairly recently on Pocillopora, and also um, it was incorporated into, as a topic in our um, like easy mode SPS. And uh, it's gonna be featured once again pretty heavily in like the native, in the next Coral Magazine. Um, I think it's the the September October issue. I actually wrote the cover story for, and it's all about um, easy to keep SPS. So if you're uh, if you're a subscriber to Coral, you can check that out. Some some cool photography and stuff like that in there. But yeah, this is one of the easier to keep um, SPS. They're they're very um, I guess you know they're they're easy to keep in a, a bunch of different lighting types, a bunch of different flows. So. Um, yeah, if, if you're looking to experiment just a little bit and you haven't tried SPS before, this is a pretty safe, uh, safe introduction. 72 is the green Pocillopora damicornis. Seventy-three. So. I'm like noticing just how much better things look on this side of the tank versus that other side. It's more difficult than Pocillopora. They um, they tend to need more lighting, um, but they also come in some pretty interesting colors, like this bright canary yellow. Uh, they're also the type of coral that um, is the same thing as that Bismal Worm Rock. So you want to definitely be able to keep that the coral part of it alive, so that the that the uh, you know the worms don't don't die also, because they kind of do need that symbiotic relationship. Seventy-five. 
It's our large colony of yellow parietes. It's a very cool canary yellow, um, and it's definitely something that stands out even in an SPS tank. It has a completely different growth form than just about everything. It looks like a Montipora. Like you might say, well, it looks like a Montipora digitata, for example. But when you see uh, the thickness of its growth, it's like um, it's like five times the thickness. So it's very nubby. Okay, next up. 76, Pink Bird's Nest. It's a fairly small frag, but this stuff grows pretty quickly. And to, uh, to maintain that pink coloration, you um, definitely want to give it slightly higher light. Um, normally, I would recommend uh, like lower light, actually, for, um, for this type of coral. But uh, it definitely does have better coloration. Uh, obviously, if you're buying a pink bird's nest, you'd like it to be pink. So a little bit higher light, but don't burn it. 77 in a second. <laughs> Actually, I lied. Let's quickly go over the rules. I, I promised that I was going to go over the rules at, at halftime, but I went to the bathroom instead. So um, this is how the live cell works. Um, we've gone through uh, about 70 or so um, corals already. Uh, you can watch it and chat with us live on YouTube. And you can also go and purchase corals uh, that, that you're seeing live on TitleGardens.com. Uh, follow the, the live sale link. It's, it can be found in like the top right. It's a blinking red dot, so just look for that. And you can see all, all these corals are all numbered. Uh, shipping, $39.99, or it's free for orders over $250. And uh, as you go, uh, the shipping option to select is the local pickup live sale. Every now and again, uh, somebody pays for shipping five times or something like that. They don't have to refund shipping five times or four times, depending. Um, so yeah, just, just keep an eye out for that. You want to select that local pickup live sale option. All right. Anyway, if you have, if you have any questions, toss it into chat. OK. So what number are we on? 77? Okay. This is our Panape bird's nest? No, yes, it is. Okay, so the Panape bird's nest is kind of, a, kind of an interesting character. It's got really sharp tips compared to the other types of bird's nest. And right now it's very similar in coloration to the next one that you'll see, which is the uh, bird of paradise, which has like more of a, like, uh, a yellow base, slight green tint and all that. Um, pink highlights, but uh, the thing about these guys is if you provide them like really, really strong lighting, they'll transition to an all pink color. So you can kind of get everything in between. You can get this rainbow look all the way to like a solid pink look, depending on, on how much lighting you give this thing. Uh, next up, 78, is that Bird of Paradise. Probably my favorite. Has, has kind of like more dull tips, but is consistently this, this rainbow look. Okay, 79. It's a hot pick chalice. It's just a frag. But uh, like so far, th this guy's cut up really, uh, really well. It's healed really nicely. So um, yeah, I mean, if you're looking for like a big splash of like fluorescent pink and uh, you're looking for like a plating coral, this might be the, the thing for you. Chalices are always kind of hit or miss in terms of like their, their hardiness, mainly because, um, and, I, and I've, I've said this many times before, but chalice isn't like a real category. Um, it covers like 10, 15 different genera of coral, all of which are completely different from one another. The only thing that they really share in common is that they're flat. That's pretty much it. If it's shaped kind of like flat, like a plate, it's a chalice coral. So, um, care requirements are going to vary substantially. How easy they are to propagate is going to um, vary a lot. How much lighting to give them, all of that is going to really depend. So um, this, this one so far has seemed pretty hardy. 
Uh, and this, of course, launches into our entire section of chalices, so we'll just go from there. Number 80. These are always pretty cool. Like the, the I like to call these the, the Cyclops chalices because they have like a very uh, distinctive uh, you know center of the polyp. Their their outer skin is very cool too. I mean it's got like the, the pink and green going on, but that center actually has fluorescent orange and stuff like that. Next up, it's our blue-eyed lithophyllin. The, the base is like a purplish cobalt color, eyes are sky blue, and you can see how just how different this looks, yet it's still very much classified as a chalice like the rest of them. Um, lithophyllin almost look like uh, fungia, like plate corals, um, but you can see it has like a bunch of different uh, mouths on it. Don says, Than has ASMR in spades. I would just like to listen to him talk. I don't know what that means. I have to Google that. <laughs> uh, maybe not. Okay, so number 82. Golden Eye Chalice. That's a typo. It is not $2. How much is it really? It's probably 20 Let me see. What number is that? 82? 25. Go ahead and fix that right now. All right, much better. Well, then again, if it is actually says two dollars on the website, that's a completely different story. Go ahead, go ahead and check out with it at two dollars. But for the purpose of the show, it's a typo. Um, Eighty-three is our golden chalice. We need to crank the exposure just a little bit to see all the coloration. But um, these guys, as far as chalices go, might be my favorite, just because it's, it's a single color. It's just this bright, bright yellow. But it's completely fluorescent. It's, it has one of the most intense um, uh, glowing looks under LED, for example. So if you just wanted like some like highlighter colored chalice, this is the one. And the price isn't crazy. We used to sell this stuff for about $75 an inch, but it's a lot less expensive for the live show. All right, number 84. This is a pink pinstripe chalice. It's similar to the hot pink one that we started this entire set on, except it's got um, like a blue involved as well. So it's kind of like this, uh, this blue and pink pinstripe going on. Chainsaw Reptiles asks, Hey man, can I have some help? I'm getting some green slime covering my zoas. So green slime is, um, at its roots, it, this is a chemical issue that you're having with your tank. It's not actually like so much of an algae issue. It's a nutrient export issue. So the thing I would recommend is to provide that, um, that zoa colony a lot more flow to begin with, but I would ramp up the amount of water changes that you're doing. It almost doesn't matter what kind of slime it is, um, like any of the like the purples, the 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 black slime, red slime, all of that. It it is at its core a nutrient issue. So you want to take care of like the fundamentals of your water chemistry there. Okay, number eighty five. Our cosmic chalice. Now we call this the Cosmic Chalice because, oh man, it, this, there's no way this is going to show up on stream because it's like so fine detailed. Um, and you're going to lose that in that 720p deliciousness that YouTube likes to chew up my videos with. So hopefully it does show up. I doubt it will. But the sections of this coral that look blue aren't solid blue. They're the tiniest little tiny speckles, almost like stars. So you're, you're getting like this, this blue speckle on top of purple. Now that purple is a lot lighter in July here than it is going to be in December. So like in, in towards the winter time in you know, basically peak season for things like acans and chalices, this coral gets very dark. It's like a deep dark purple, almost black. 
And then on top of that, you have these like bright, bright little blue dots. So that's why we call this such a cosmic chalice. So S-A-S-M-R stands for Aut Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. Nice. Okay, so 86. It's our mean green chalice. This is a really interesting coloration that we're seeing now in, uh, in summertime because in wintertime, the entire thing is green, solid, solid green. But right now we're getting purple base green polyps. Again, it is just a, a lighting and temperature difference that we're seeing. Number 87. So prismatic acro. So it looks like we're done with the chalices and now we're on to some, some acropora and, and I think montipora after that. So thanks for saying all those nice things about my voice. I get a lot of hate for my voice also. <laughs> if, if you read the comments on, on my YouTube videos, occasionally you'll see some fun stuff. About how much people hate me. Uh, number 88. It's our purple acropora. These guys are usually a little bit more um, more of a turquoise color, but right now you're seeing um, some of the purple come out. Number 89. We'll be here in a sec. So blue tip acro. looks like, um, I don't know, probably about an inch and a half, almost two inches in size. It's pretty fast growing uh, acro. And I expect it to have some, some better coloration soon. You know, for the longest time, we weren't even able to keep acropora at this greenhouse. Um, this, the, the seasonal fluctuations just kill these things off in mass here. So this is the first time that um, we've actually done really well with acros in a, in a very, very, very long time. So I'm, I'm slightly pleased with how that's going. Number 90. <clears throat> so this is that Acropora Locani stuff. It's a, uh, I don't know if it's, it's in, if it's a deep water or not, but they have these long stretchy, uh, stretchy branches with like these small little terminal polyps. And this one in particular has got these bright yellow tips. Ninety-one. The ice fire echinata. People have been asking for uh, about this for like the longest time, and so we finally have a few frags, and they do sell pretty quickly on our website. So this is a tiny piece for twenty bucks. So um, as I mentioned, I wrote that article about easy to keep SPS. Acropora are not on that list. In fact, acros are pretty much as hard as and difficult as it gets. But what's also funny is that if you have an, an Acropora dominated tank that you're doing very, very well with, chances are if you then add in some of the easier ones, you, they might struggle because the sort of conditions that the easier ones do well in, um, it's very different than what um, a light loving Acropora would like. So you kind of have to pick and choose sometimes. 92 is our Oregon Tort. This is probably one of the most popular uh, types of Acropora. This guy's only about a little bit less than an inch, I would say. We're always trying to grow this thing out, um, and uh, people tend to just tend to buy it as soon as it, bec it becomes available. So it's it's oh, it's like this little uphill battle to just to try to propagate it. Ninety three. Not really sure this thing's name, it's just a random fuzzy Acropora. I just like its shape. We moved it to this tank recently, so uh, it's a little bit more closed up, but uh, the polyps usually extend more on this one than on other Acros, so that's why it gets a, a furrier look. 
So Chainsaw Reptiles asks, is a yellow peacock wrasse reef safe? I suppose it depends on, on what you consider reef safe. If you have inverts and stuff like that, you're probably going to have some, some, some challenges. Um, it might knock some stuff over when it gets larger, that sort of thing. Um, it, it's, I guess like reef safe is always depending on what you're trying to keep safe. So for example, we have a, a 300 gallon tub with a, a very large wrasse. We've got a, a harlequin tusk. And a tusk will not bother coral. It will not bother other fish, really. But if you have any kind of shellfish in there, it's going to murder it. Snails murdered, that sort of thing. 94, moving on. It's a purple and gold Monty. This is, you, if you look back at other live sales, we've, we've had this coral pretty consistently and you can see how it's changing color. Very light purple polyps now, very light yellow base. Moving on, 95. This is Scarlet Montipora, an encrusting variety. Montipora are a little bit easier to keep than uh, than Acropora, but they still do uh, you know require some like the the elevated lighting and uh, and really stable water chemistry. Um, so I distinguish Acropora and Montipora as being like the harder to keep stuff, um, just just to like differentiate it from the easier to keep stuff. But most people would consider Montipora pretty easy to keep too. The reason why I kind of separated it out is because the care requirements for Montipora more are more similar to what you would see with Acropora than with like the Pasilaporas and Seriatoporas and stuff like that. So moving on to 96. By the way, uh, you can kind of see in the background one of the coolest Favias that we've ever gotten. Check him out. I can't wait to start fragging that up. Favia tend to grow pretty slowly, so hopefully this one grows faster. But in person, those, uh, the, the eyes are almost completely stark white. So you have this bright green and stark white eyes. It's a very cool piece, but hopefully sometime later. Go back to 96. <laughs> it's our neon green plating Montipora. Uh, Darren Hockey asks, did your carbon dosing work out? I dosed sugar water and um, my nitrates, um, got my nitrates to zero from 80. Pretty good. My carbon dosing didn't work out. Um, we got some weird algae and uh, stuff looked really goofy and I think we lost some SPS. But then again, we didn't know what we were doing. So there's that. And you know, strangely, it made our entire greenhouse smell like vodka. We would put in like, you know, like five to seven mLs and you could smell vodka throughout the greenhouse just from that, putting into a thousand gallons. It was the strangest thing. 97. Purple Sand Dollar Montipora. Yeah, and the, that vodka smell was really, really strange, and it was actually kind of embarrassing because one, one of our customers that had come over, I guess, was like a recovering alcoholic, and the entire greenhouse smelled like vodka. So that wasn't helping the situation at all. So we, we, we stopped dosing. 98. Ah, we have to switch. Now, having said that, I know a lot of folks have a lot of success with both carbon dosing, um, and I, I, I want to check out my friend uh, Will's tank. I did a, a, a video on his tank earlier um, in the year, or last year, and um, I want to go back and see that once he's like all done, because he was doing like a, oh, what do you call it, uh, Zeovit, which I've never done before. I guess it's like... You, you add in chemicals to like directly remove nitrate to directly remove phosphate. Um, so you basically are eliminating the actual bacterial portion of, of all the processes in your tank. And you get very different results with that. Now obviously I can't do that for like thousands of gallons because that would be prohibitively expensive. But I mean it was an interesting concept and, and the success that he was having previously doing like the carbon dosing and stuff I was very impressed with. So I, I am kind of curious to, to revisit that. So this purple tip hammer, number 98, is uh, an Indonesian variety. It's a very fast growing one. It'll grow little tiny buds at its base, and each little bud will turn into uh, a new head 
of, of, uh, of hammer. 99. Purple tip frog spawn. Also Indonesian. This looks like a single head, whereas the previous one had two heads. But I'm, I'm looking carefully to see if there's any buds forming on this guy. I don't see any. No, not really. Maybe forming, but not really pronounced. You, you'll be able to see them more easily once they get larger. But yeah, another Indonesian variety. Number 100. This guy's getting blown around a little bit in the current. Um, he kind of has like a pump directed at him. But it's, a, it's an Australian hybrid hammer. We call them hybrids whenever they have like the mixing of like the purple and green at their tips. Almost like a kind of like an electrical staticky pattern. I was hoping that these guys would be more open, but sometimes they just don't cooperate for a live show. So, 101. Ugh, they're all closed. Um, this is the solid green hammer. Let's see, 102, are we gonna get luckier? Little bit, little bit, little bit better. So this is another hybrid, you see the, uh, the uh, purple and green tips. This one has a little bit more purple than green, whereas the, the very first one had more green than purple. Okay, oh, and I should mention, the Australian hammers they grow much more slowly than the Indonesian ones. So I would expect a new head every like six, seven, eight months versus like 10 new heads every six, seven, eight months with the Indonesian stuff. But for aesthetics, personally, I think these guys have better, better coloration. The, uh, the Australian versus the Indonesian are hardier. And Tokyo says, glad I didn't miss a stream. Glad you could make it. I'm kind of like chugging right along. Like I said, it's gonna get blistering hot here soon and I just don't want my computer to melt. So 104, this is an Australian, uh, 105? 103, my bad. 103. Purple branching bubble coral. Pearl branching bubble coral. It's got two little algae spots. Sometimes their skeleton pokes out and then it grows a little bit of algae at, at its tip. And it's got, this one has three heads. Where's the third head? Okay, so I guess there's a third head in the back. All right, moving on, number 104. All of these Australian hybrid hammers did not like us moving them into this photography tank. <laughs> They're all kind of closed. Uh, we'll do it live, people. We'll do it live. Okay, so somebody was asking about scolemias earlier. 105 is our first. It's our red sun scoli. Is there any way we can prop him up? Yeah, he may have just fallen over. There we go. Great. We'll check focus in a sec here, but you get the idea. It's a, it's a solid red color. Scolies are like a really nice like signature piece to a tank. Um, they've got great fluorescence, and sometimes they have like really 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 intricate patterns and stuff. The ones we're selling today are, are pretty uh, monochromatic. Um, we've got this red one, and the next one is. Uh, our teal scully. We've got a nice one actually on the website, but obviously it's a little bit more expensive than $70 for like the more intricate patterns and stuff like that. Hopefully in a little while here, we'll, we'll get some other uh, scullies for the next show. Next up, this is the Scarlet Snowflake Cynarina. It's got the red and the white. I know that, I think Bethany was asking earlier about, this, about Cynarinas. Number 
Next up, 108. This is just a Scarlet Saint Arena, all red. As far as LPS goes, these are one of my favorites. I mean, I, I like their, their translucence. Uh, and they, also, they when they get larger and larger, they have like this, uh, like the, just the way that it kind of like flops over, just just on, almost under its own weight. It seems very, very cool. And they just kind of like spread out and chill. 109. There's a neon green trachea. And yes, it is actually that bright. It is a ridiculously fluorescent coral. And you can compare that to 110, which is our pinstripe. So you can see just how much brighter it is. But this guy's got a cool pattern. It's got that purple and green pinstripe look. Unfortunately, it's not possible to, uh, to propagate trachees. 111 in a moment, but it will be a purple lobo. And lobophilia, you can propagate. It just takes a little bit of time. It doesn't make commercial sense to propagate lobos, but um, it can be done. They heal. Get some orange highlights as well. Okay. Moving on. We've got a two polyp Duncan coral. These guys are Australian. Next one up, also a two polyp Duncan. See, it's interesting how like certain corals just totally are super photogenic and like open up right away. Then you have like some of the um, the hammers just stay closed for an entire day. All right, next up here, 114. I need to change something because there's a a typo on this one too. Another two dollar coral. So this is one's twenty five. All right, yellow scroll. Have to fix a typo there. If you're looking for something that's like a like a plate forming coral that is easier to take care of than like a Montipora, um, that's not quite as aggressive as a chalice. This one's a pretty decent one to consider. We're making good time. We've only been on, on for about uh, an hour and 20 minutes. So 115. Is there a tricolor oulophilia? So oulophilias are maze brains, like true maze brains. And uh, this guy has got looks looks like what some yellow, green, purple. Pretty sweet coral. 116. So this is the first time I've ever seen this as far as Favites goes. Um, I love the coloration. It's got three different colors. It's got the teal, the purple, and the red. And it kind of like these concentric rings. It's the, it, like I said, it's the first time I've seen this and it's, uh, it's very distinctive. And Favites tends to grow a lot faster than Favia. So we're hoping to, to propagate these guys in the future too. So that was 116. Moving on to 117 here. This is our prism favia. So slow doesn't even fully describe it. They're one of the slowest growing stony corals I've ever seen. I mean, if you're really patient with it, it's great for like a home aquarium. 
but for somebody like me that tries to propagate stuff, it's, it's crazy slow. Okay, 118. This is our green-eyed Favites. Can we pop that one up too? Yeah, we can try. Now we'll try to pop this guy up because uh, he's got, um, yeah, there we go. Okay, so moving on, we've got 119, which is a marble favites. Kind of got the purple and teal colors all, all modeled together there. And then the last of our favites is the Midnight Princess, number 120. So. This, as, uh, as you get into like the darker seasons, that purple that you see in the middle will get much, much darker. And the, and the green stays more or less that fluorescent green. So it almost looks like j all you see is just these, uh, these green halos. Okay, we're almost done. Can you guys imagine? I'm speeding right through with all this. 121. Is our orange Liptastria. These guys have this uh, bright orange center with uh, a purple, um, like outer polyp. Well, Juan Husen says, awesome, all the way from Singapore. You're welcome. I love Singapore when I visited. I need to go visit Singapore again. We were only able to stay there for a few days, but um, I really liked it a lot. It's very, very impressive. I want to stay at the Marina Bay Sands and swim in that pool all day. Number uh, 122. If you haven't seen the Marina Bay Sands, go Google that right now, everybody that's that's uh, listening to the stream. It's uh, this, I think it's like a, a five billion dollar, uh, an infinity pool that's bigger than a football field on the top floor which is like the 65th floor and it looks out over the downtown of, of Singapore. It's amazing. So 122 is the yellow Leptastria. Okay. And 123 is our baby's breath Favia. Now I expect this guy to look a lot better um, once we get into the fall. The thing that separates this guy out is that it's got this speckled face and it might be hard to see just with the compression that you're going to see in YouTube, but the speckles on this one, kind of like, remember I was talking about the Cosmic Chalice, how there's like these pinpoint little, uh, little dots, the, the, the pinpoint little dots on a baby's breath Favia are all different colored. So there's like, there's like yellow ones, there's blue ones, there's green ones. So it, it almost looks like a kind of an even yellowish green. But when you look really closely, there's like blues and everything, all, all manner of colors that are all in, the, in that speckled inside. It's one of the most, most interesting uh, Favia corals out there. And uh, we try like heck to propagate this stuff. But you know, sometimes um, it sells. Sometimes it um, one of them like catches a bug or something like that, and then we have to kind of like start that one over. But um, yeah, it's it, it gets incredible coloration, especially um, once you transition into the into the cooler months. One twenty four. Galaxia. So Galaxia is a uh, it's a pretty easy, fast growing uh, LPS. It forms this like you know tightly bound colony cluster. Um, the thing that's unfortunately Galaxy is known for is so. Excuse me. So be prepared to give it quite a bit of room because as soon as it detects other corals near it, out come these sweepers and they just kind of go out stinging everything. 
So if you've got a, a spot for it, it's a great looking coral, but you do have to account for its aggression. All right, lastly, number 120 is a green Samacora. So this is a pretty curious little SPS. Um, it almost looks like moss, like really tiny moss, but it's a very, very, very fast growing and easy to care for uh, SPS. I would say that it's almost kind of like Pastelopora, but you can definitely see um, individual polyps very easily in Pastelopora, where it's much harder on Samacora. But it's kind of an oddball, and I kind of wanted to finish off the stream with that. Okay, so I will uh, just take a look at chat here to see if there was any questions or anything like that. Oh, and uh, the price on the Samacora wasn't listed, but it looks like it is $30. I'll go ahead and fix that right now. Okay, so $30. And that pretty much does it for the live show, guys. So again, thanks for, uh, thanks for tuning in, joining me on a very, very, very sweltering hot July Saturday. Um, hope you guys enjoy the rest of the weekend. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, you guys also got to, to pick up some new corals here. We'll, um, we'll, get, we'll, we'll set up dates to, to ship everything out. Um, we're probably going to be doing the, the majority of it like Monday, Tuesday, but if you've got like a preferred date, just let me know. Um, and it looks like we might be including some ice packs into all this stuff, depending on where they're going, just because of the temperatures. But fingers crossed it should all work out. So last check on questions. Uh, to stop fighting. Fortunately, you're probably not going to be able to do anything other than to start removing tangs. Tangs are one of those fish that like completely gets overdone in, in aquariums, and it's kind of um, it's kind of a shame because like if you ever see them in the wild, like you'd almost say, think that there's no way they should even be kept in captivity. And we kind of reluctantly do it just because they're such good um, algae control. But uh, generally speaking, if you're, if you're stacking a lot of, of tangs into your aquarium, um, you're kind of asking for trouble, especially ones of the same genus, like, like having multiple zebrasoma, for example, they're going to scrap. If you have like multiple uh, stenochetus, which is like the, the bristle tooth variety, they're going to fight. Um, and heaven forbid you have like a soul hall or something like that that's naturally aggressive. So yeah, you do have to kind of like watch out for that. Uh, a lot of people are asking for more information on Samacora. You know, as far as like care requirements, you don't have to, to worry a whole lot. Um, they can be kept in, in a whole bunch of different types of lighting. Um, you know, we tend to uh, keep them under basically medium light, medium flow, but it's not even that serious. Like, we've got um, one tank that we completely, and I mean completely neglect, and it's like grown all over the egg crate and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we try to give it a bunch of different types of environments, and it does well in all of them. Now, you might have to, to play around just a little bit with lighting to see, um, you know, which ones uh, are going to work the best for you. But, um, yeah, just in terms of like, the coral's coloration. But it shouldn't be that bad. Anyway, thanks again for joining us, and uh, hope to see you next time.